Uh, the last presentation in this session uh, is from Trisha Johnson. She's a senior scientist with animal genomics, uh, based with AgriSearch at the Invermay campus. Trisha works with the uh, with New Zealand sheep breeders with an eye to the future, and specifically, what attributes will be required in the future. Trisha. Good morning, everyone. This presentation is a 15 minute summary of what started out as a 70 plus page white paper within ag research condensed down to New Zealand Society of Animal Production Review. So this is gonna be a very high level overview. If anybody is interested in finding out more, there is the paper in the proceedings or there is also the white paper within ag research. So this is a presentation about the New Zealand sheep industry and the breeds that we have, how they deliver to our industry of the now, and where they need to be heading in the future. So where have we been as the New Zealand sheep industry? New Zealand has traditionally had a temperate climate, some semi-arid areas down here when we think of some high country environments. But the genetic base that we have in New Zealand has mostly been derived from breeds that we imported from the United Kingdom back decades and decades ago. We've supplemented with other imports, but a lot of those, again, have come from that United Kingdom, which, up until a few months ago, would argue that it also had a temperate climate. If we think about the production systems that we've had and the breeding programs that we have had, genetic selection within the New Zealand sheep industry has been heavily emphasised on the number of lambs born and the growth rate of those animals. And that has been driven by what the industry is paid for and has historically been paid for. We do and have had an emphasis on the weight of wool. Recently that has been removed. And that come for, for strong wool farming within the Sheep Improvement Limited. And that emphasises on the weight of wool, micron, wool colour. But what the key driver for a lot of sheep farmers at the moment is, is carcass weight with a heavy emphasis over the last number of decades on being leaner is better. One of the issues though that we have with how we have achieved some of these outcomes, genetics has been a large part of it, and I'm sitting here talking to a whole bunch of people who are very much on the management side of things, and that is absolutely critical to where we have achieved and where we have got to, but we have also had a heavy reliance on the use of on-farm chemicals to achieve some of those outcomes. Drenching our lambs on a regular basis, using zinc oxide in the North Island for facial eczema, the use of pesticides for treating and preventing fly strike. We've heard it in every single presentation so far this morning though. Our industries are facing headwinds. For the sheep industry, there are economic challenges. We have our input costs, fertilizer prices, this is from earlier this year, rising as much as 25%. We have issues with differential incomes from different products that we have. So anybody that is a strong wool farmer, we're hoping that wool impact and the likes are going to change things, but as it stands at the moment, it is more expensive to take that fleece off the animal than it is for the money that you get selling it. We have our environmental challenges. We have greenhouse gases, which we've heard about and I'll touch on in a bit further again, but we also have the issue that our climate is changing. We also have cultural and social challenges. Again, we've heard this morning, the regulations that are being thrown at the industry. But we also have, again, as we've heard, our consumers. They have increasingly different expectations around the quality and the types of products that they are willing to pay money for. I touched it on the previous slide. We also have toolbox challenges as a sheep industry. Some of those tools that we have are increasingly under question. Our ability to use drenches, drench resistance is an increasing issue with triple drench resistance on a number of properties throughout New Zealand. So we have a lot of headwinds that we are needing to think about how do we address. The review article talks about the role that genetics can play and where the sheep industry needs to go into the future. Genetics is an environmentally and ethically appropriate way 
to actually achieve some of the fundamental things we need our sheep of the future to actually have. Genetic selection is not an overnight miracle unless we can get some major genes and gene editing, which I'll talk about a little bit further on. But we do know that for a lot of the traits that I'm going to talk about today is that there is genetic variation in those traits. And if we can harness that genetic variation, we can actually start to breed for animals that are going to be more resilient and able to cope with our future production systems that we need to have. I do recognise, and, and anybody in the genetics world does recognise, that as soon as you start adding more and more traits into your selection programmes, the less progress you will make on any individual trait. However, we increasingly cannot ignore some of the traits that I'm going to be talking about into the future if we are continuing to have a successful industry into the future. The rest of this presentation is just going to give a very high level overview of what are some of those traits. Some of these traits are traits that people will know and experience, but some are ones that may be different and depending on what part of the country you're in, may be a little bit unfamiliar, but you will have farming colleagues somewhere in New Zealand that these are directly relevant to. So the traits that are a result of climate change. There are two approaches that we need to think about. There has been a lot of emphasis being placed on climate change in terms of mitigation, but increasingly we are going to also have to consider adaptation because the climate is changing and although we will do everything we can to contribute to mitigating it, we will still experience change. So the mitigation side of things, um, Jacqueline mentioned about um, the fact that we do have in the sheep industry, we do have low emission selection lines that are based at the Woodlands Research Property, just a 20 minutes drive from here. And so we, led by Suzanne Rowe and John McEwen, have been driving to be leading the world in terms of breeding for low methane sheep. We also know, and it came through very much in Ronaldo's presentation, that, that feed efficiency component of greenhouse gases, um, feed conversion efficiency or residual feed intake, as being traits that we can or should be looking to measure into the future. So effectively, that we can get the same amount of product through less feed eaten. We also saw from Ronaldo's pre um, presentation the impact of some of those levers around improved systems performance, less use but the same number of lambs born, improved growth rates so that you're not having to have those maintenance feed requirements carrying right through for as longer, having less disease so that you have, don't have to have such high replacement rates because you've lost fewer animals. These are all parts of the way that we can go towards having a mitigation aspect to our breeding programs. Adaption and resilience. This is something that whilst we will say that we are always changing in the way that we think about our farming industries and, and how we actually farm, there are some things that are confronting the New Zealand sheep industry, particularly in certain parts of the North Island, but equally down here. I farm in East Otago and we, we equally have some issues as a result of climate change and the disease profile risk that we're experiencing. What we are seeing with our climate change that is already occurring is that we have already seen the hottest seven years on record um, occur since 2020. So we are already starting to see this impact and this is having an impact on everything right through and I'm sure this conference is going to be full of presentations of people thinking about the impact of this climate change on pastures and production profiles of those pastures and crops. New Zealand is no longer exclusively a temperate climate. If we look to this map of the world down here below, we can just see New Zealand down here and that line there is the subtropical line. Northland has always kind of sat somewhere on that subtropical line, but if we look at the definitions of what subtropical weather actually define as, Northland having its tagline of the winterless north, it is a subtropical climate. So we need to actually start thinking about the fact that we no longer have strictly a temperate climate in which we are farming. And what are the results of these things? What are the results of us actually having a subtropical climate and having more and more hot years in terms of where our sheep need to be going? 
Heat stress is something that had not been documented in New Zealand sheep until the last 18 months. Work that's been undertaken by the welfare and behaviour team at Ruakura, and I'm about to start take, undertaking some work on this as well, is to start thinking about heat stress in New Zealand sheep. Work in the dairy industry that's just been completed in the last year started to st think about heat stress in terms of more than just temperature and humidity index, but also thinking about things of solar radiation and wind speed. It's not just the temperature either, it's the humidity that we see in the likes of Northland. And so increasingly seeing those kind of subtropical conditions. The issue that we have in New Zealand is the fact that most of our breeds are actually temperate derived. They haven't seen those type of conditions. They don't know how to perform in those type of conditions because they are not physiologically designed for it. Maybe there are some out there, but we have done no measurements to actually understand who can handle a Northland, um, Northland autumn. I see a colleague in the audience and we can tell you that Romneys don't. So one of the things that we need to think about is what other breeds can we actually start to be using within our industry. Over the last 20 years, we have had a proliferation of minority breeds enter into the country but a lot of those have been ad hoc, very limited numbers, and quite a few of those have actually been from arid type countries. So we have Damaras and Dorpers. They don't know what humidity looks like. They know what hot, hot conditions look like, but their feet and their overall body do not know how to, con how to combat what is a humid Northland environment. We also have those issues that I also identified about the fact that some of the tools that we have in our toolbox are changing, and that is going to drive how productive and how successful we can be into the future. This is an example of um, work from Demina et al. out of Ruakura in 2009, looking at the impact of where facial eczema is going to be an issue in New Zealand under a three degree climate change scenario. To the left was where facial eczema historically was an issue, to the right where it is predicted to be an issue. In 2016, the North Island was an underestimate of how badly facial eczema affected farmers in the North Island. There were dairy cows euthanized on the West Coast. The East Coast was in a severe drought, so they did not experience facial eczema. But we're going into an issue where the European Union has actually banned, or is in the process of banning, the use of prophylactic zinc for treating neonatal diarrhea in piglets, but yet it is our number one tool in our toolbox outside of genetics for preventing facial eczema in the North Island. If we think about Barber's pole or Homonchus contortus as one of our internal parasites, it also follows a very similar pattern in terms of the warmer our climate gets, the more it is moving down the country and a bigger issue it is becoming. At the same time, we're dealing with resistance to increasing numbers of our drenches. So we have some real issues for some of these disease traits there are programs of work, Beef and Lamb New Zealand are looking to fund additional funding and research in facial eczema. That's understanding the fungus, but genetics is a real key way that we can do, deal with this. Very quickly, other traits that we need to start thinking about, some of the physical traits. We had, um, over the last two years, there has been an increased emphasis on tail length and the tail length that we are allowed to, to tail to there are a number of farmers who are increasingly thinking, well, should I be tailing full stop? But if we had a super long Romney-type tail with the dags that go with it, that is an ethical issue for the industry. And so we need to be starting to think about these kind of short tails that are present in some of the breeds that we have in New Zealand. Um, Scobie down here with his ethically improved sheep, bare bellies, bare breeches. They're in some of the breeds that we have in the New Zealand sheep industry already but they have not been carried through and extensively utilised, but they offer huge opportunities to the way that we farm. I've emphasised all of the kind of other traits that we need to think about, but we can't take our eye off production, and product quality is still going to be exceptionally important. We need to emphasise the number of, optimise the number of lambs born, lamb survival, um, and we need to have growth despite these challenges. 
our products. We still need these lean carcasses, but increasingly our consumers want that quality coming through with things like intramuscular fat. So these are some of the breeds we already have in New Zealand. Um, Wiltshires, um, Dorpers, Damaras, our fins with the short tails. But we are increasingly looking to identify some overseas genetics that could be also utilised. So we have here the Katardins from the States and also Barbados Black Valley. There are some other breeds over in Australia and the UK that are being developed, whether they have the heat tolerance. And the big issue that we have is around that facial eczema tolerance that we're going to have to breed into these. So how do we get to where we need to go? Physical traits, these are under strong genetic control, often breed linked, others with moderate heritability. One of the issues we have is all of these minor breeds that have been imported have been done in a very ad hoc basis, not under the scientific ways that we did back when we had the first importations in the 90s and 80s. We need to go back to understanding some of the basics and actually thoroughly feening typing these animals to understand what attributes they can bring to the industry. We then need to have integration of some of those traits into some of our existing breeds. Something like taking a Romney base that we already know has a facial eczema tolerance. We need gene integration using traditional ways, but ideally John Caritas is going to get everything over the line with, with GE and we'll be able to take tail length as an example to quickly introduce a short tail into every single breed in New Zealand if we could achieve gene editing. What we also need to do is demonstration flocks to show this change. Although we're adaptive, there is definitely some reluctance and we do need to overcome this. So Cheryl Ed was a co-author of this paper who tirelessly worked the sheep industry and she passed away this time last year and the last email I received from her was on this topic and this was her quote. We do need to emphasise that breeders, farmers need to be looking to the future. There are other few choice words she put in the email um, about Scobie having done this work a long time ago and that the breeders have been very slow to take it up but this is a tribute to Cheryl Ann and her work. Thank you, Tricia. The papers in this morning's session were designed to stimulate your thinking and ground your conversations over the next couple of days and beyond as well. And I think you'll agree with me that um, each of the speakers has over-delivered this morning. So can you join me again, please, in thanking them all.